our reading this morning, Reverend Cindy has chosen a Zen Buddhist story. Maybe yes, maybe no. Once there was a Chinese farmer who worked his poor farm together with his son and their horse. When the horse ran off one day, the neighbors came and said, how unfortunate for you. The farmer replied, maybe yes, maybe no. When the horse returned, followed by a herd of wild horses, the neighbors gathered and exclaimed, how lucky for you. The farmer stayed calm and replied, maybe yes, maybe no. While trying to tame one of the wild horses, the farmer's son fell and broke his leg. He had to rest up and couldn't help with the farm choice, chores. How sad for you, the neighbors cried. Maybe yes, maybe no, said the farmer. Well, shortly thereafter, a neighboring army threatened the farmer's village. All the young men in the village were drafted to fight the invaders. Many died, but the farmer's son has been left out of the fighting because of his broken leg. <clears throat> People said to the farmer, Whew, what a good thing your son couldn't fight. Maybe yes, maybe no, was all the farmer said. I've been intrigued by the unexpected places where I find inspiration, especially when I'm least looking for it. You know, sometimes it comes from a conversation with a friend. Sometimes it comes in a dream. Sometimes it comes from the way the light comes through the window and just touches something on my counter. Sometimes it comes from standing in the checkout line at the grocery store while I'm paging through People magazine. You know, and then there are the, the old faithfuls. There could be lyrics from a song that I heard long ago that lift me up when I feel lost. There might be a particular poem that reminds me of things that I've forgotten. Stories, some like were, have been told today, Return, to, uh, return us again and again to help us remember that life goes on. And I've been finding, I've been looking for those kinds of things in this particular time in, in the life of this country. Uh, we all know that this is a particularly important midterm election, and there are those questions that keep running through my head. And one time I was told that to remember was to become a member or a part of the whole once more. So in truly remembering, I bring a deep awareness of what I know into practice. And by this process, I'm able to see more of the whole. And in the process, I'm immersed in that which is holy once more. And my point with all of this is that spirit or whatever you want to call it is everywhere and it is ready to meet us when our hearts are open to receiving the messages that are offered to us. So as I've been thinking about all of these unexpected places where I might find inspiration, I turn to one of my trusted sources, which is the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And every few years since my teens, I've reread this set of books when I needed a reminder that no matter how dark things may seem, the story goes ever onward. And I don't know who's familiar with the stories or not, but you'll get a little synopsis in a moment. Because there is another significant election, I've been asking those questions that were presented in our opening words. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? And I decided to pull the books off my shelf again and go through them because even though they're a work of fiction, I have found a real sense of steadiness, reminders that the story goes ever onward and I can better live in that period of unanswered questions with more equanimity and calm.
So I'm going to invite you to take a little journey with me this morning as we explore some excerpts and some um, reflections that I have about those experts, excerpts. So I'm asking you to listen and discover for yourself what instruction, what inspirations might speak to you this morning. So I'm going to give you a little synopsis in case you're not familiar with these stories. Uh, the series of three books was written by J.R.R. Tolkien. It's been an, a classic work. It takes place, the story takes place in a mythical world of Middle Earth. And this is a world that's inhabited by men and elves, wizards and dwarves, hobbits, and many unsavory characters like goblins and orcs. And the most terrifying of all is a being called Sauron, and he's known as the Dark Lord of Mordor. So the unfolding story deals with the recovering and the ultimate destruction of the One Ring of Power. And this was created by Sauron many ages prior to bring all other beings of Middle Earth under his dominion. So through a series of adventures, this ring has found its way into the keeping of a hobbit by the name of Frodo Baggins. Now hobbits are peace-loving creatures who spend much of their time in the simple pursuits of life, of gardening, eating and drinking, and just generally enjoying life. A council of the wise was called to determine what to do with this ring, that it has now reappeared, and it's desperately being sought by Sauron, and it's putting all of Middle Earth at great risk. The council decides that it's not possible to keep it, for the power of the ring is such that it will eventually corrupt anyone who attempts to use it. And it can only, the only way to deal with this is to destroy it by casting it into the fiery crevices of Mount Doom where it was created. The council selects a company of nine for this mission. There were two men, there was Gandalf the wizard and elf, some hobbits, and among them were Sam and Frodo. So their mission is to set out for Mount Doom to destroy the ring or perish in the attempt. And against seemingly insurmountable odds, the company sets off. So in order to hopefully bring this a little more to life, Jamie's going to join me and she's going to read the quotes from the, the text itself. So near the beginning of the story, Gandalf is instructing Frodo in some of the ancient history concerning the ring that has now come into Frodo's keeping by way of his uncle, Bilbo. But last night I told you of Sauron the Great, the Dark Lord. The rumors that you have heard are true. He has indeed risen again. Always after a defeat and a respite, the shadow takes another shape and grows again. I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. And I know I've thought many times, you know, I wish that these times were not the times that I'm alive in. I wish that climate change were not an issue. I wish the political situation were different. But this story reminds me that all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. How we got here, why such things are happening to us now. In the final analysis, we can't fully ignore it, but in the final analysis, it's immaterial. The fact is that we are here, we are now, these are the things that are confronting us. So the question for us to answer is, how are we going to respond to this time and this place? So the story goes on. Frodo and his companions arrive after many difficulties and trials to Rivendell, which is the home of Elrond the Wise and one of the last safe places in the dark times that they're in. The story of the ring is shared in a great council and Elrond reminds those gathered. You have done well to come. You will hear today all that you need in order to understand the purposes of the enemy. There is naught that you can do other than to resist with hope or without it, but you do not stand alone. And I find that to be such a significant reminder 
none of us are alone in this process. Whatever, whatever the vote is going to hold on Tuesday, we're not alone. And we need to be reminded of that. Our hearts rejoice when we're able to share our deepest fears, our concerns, and our joys with one another. It's truly uplifting to remember that we are not alone. Story goes on. The council continues the discussion of what's to happen to this terrible, terrible and beautiful ring of power. Thus we return once more to the de destroying of the ring, said Aristor, and yet we come no nearer. What strength have we for finding the of the fire in which it was made? That is a path of despair, of folly, I would say, if the long wisdom of Elvon did not forbid me. Despair or folly, said Gandalf. It is not despair, for despair is only for those who see the end beyond all doubt, and we do not. So I want to return to the reading that uh, Jamie did earlier, maybe yes, maybe no. And I think about how often we let our fears sweep us away when in truth, we do not see the end beyond all doubt. And it's difficult to discern what in the ultimate scheme of things is good or bad. We do our best to make those determinations and to respond accordingly, but it's a great practice to wait and see and remain present and attentive to the task that we are given in a particular moment. For a while, the hobbits continued to talk and think of the past journey and of the perils that lay ahead, but such was the virtue of the land of Rivendell that soon all fear and anxiety was lifted from their minds. The future, good, or ill was not forgotten, but ceased to have any power over the present. They were content with every good day that, as it came, taking pleasure in every meal and every word and song. Being present. And I used the word practice just a few moments ago. Here in this simple phrase exists a lifetime of practice to be present. A dear friend of mine shared recently that amidst all of the swirl of things that are going on in the world, you know, the, the war in Ukraine, the climate change, the political the circumstances, a world that we are in that is in great transition. Amidst all of this, she walked out into a meadow a few weeks ago and beheld the beauty of the full moon shining down upon her. She said she was very conscious of this very same moon shining upon the people of Ukraine, of Russia, of indeed all of the world. And in spite of the bittersweet tug at her heart for all that feels broken and wrong, she was able to give herself over to the gentle beauty and stillness of that night. So let us not forget in our darkest of times to be present to what is and to savor the blessings that are found therein. So returning to the story, after finding comfort and aid once again with another set of elves in a land called Lothlorien, it was apparent to the travelers that the journey must continue. I don't wanna leave. All the same, I'm beginning to feel that if we've gotta go on, then we best get it over with. It's the job that never started as takes the longest to finish, as my old gaffer used to say. And I suspect that most of you are familiar with the phrase, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So let us be reminded to begin. Let us start the job, take the first step of that which is ours to do, the hardest task, once begun is that much closer to being completed. And should we choose on the journey that we endeavor to bring with us the continued awareness of presence, of mindfulness, we may discover that the task is less of a burden than we might have anticipated. 
So the travelers prepared to set off on the next part of their journey. Galadriel, the Lady of Lothlorien, sent them off with this parting wisdom. For the fate of Lothlorien, you are not answerable, but only for the doing of your own task. A young friend of mine has been known to exclaim, I want to save the world. And you know what a truly noble and admirable proposal. And it's not one that I'm going to try and to discourage her from attempting. And even with that youthful optimism and, and the delight that I take in that, I find myself at times becoming immobilized by the truly enormous need that exists in the world. There's a worthy cause to give time and attention to anywhere that you look. You have to wonder, where do you begin? So I'm grateful for the reminder that I don't have to attend to all of it, but my responsibility, our responsibility lies in recognizing and carrying out what is ours to do. And to remember that one person really does make a difference. And I think about Shannon lifting up um, the woman, Joan Mulholland, you know, a young 19 year old woman who, a Southern white Christian woman going into the deep South in the early 60s, putting herself at great harm. And she did not give up. She stayed to her task. And here she is in her 80s now. Uh, an inspiration to all of us that you, you do the task that's in front of you. So well into the series of books, our good friends, Frodo and Sam, they're long separated from the rest of the company and they find their, their paths caught up with Gollum. And he was a previous bearer of the ring uh, he was a sad and wretched creature. The power of the ring calls to him constantly. The ring has become his addiction, his obsession, and he will do anything to try and possess it once more. Well, what has got to be done with it, said Sam. Tie it up so as it can't come sneaking after us no more, I say. No said Frodo, if we kill him, we must kill him outright. But we can't do that, not as things are. Poor wretch, he's done us no harm. Oh, hasn't he, said Sam, rubbing his shoulder. Anyway, he means to. He meant to, I warn, throttle us in our sleep. That's his plan. I dare say, said Frodo, but what he means to do is another matter. It seemed to Frodo then that he heard quite plainly but far off voices out of the past. What a pity Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had the chance. Pity? It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy not to strike without need. I do not feel any pity for Gollum. He deserves death, deserves death, I dare say he does. Many live that deserve death and many die that deserve life. Can you give that to them? Then not, be not too eager to deal out death in the name of justice, fearing for your own safety. Even the wise cannot see all ends. So what I found here was more reminders to wait and see, reminders to step outside our individual fears to seek a bigger picture, to discover what it means to be compassionate and to weave that meaning into our daily lives, to seek something larger than our own individual understanding. And the big picture idea is reflected once more near the end of book two as Frodo and Sam journey nearer and nearer to the end of their quest, the dreaded wasteland of Mortar and Mount Doom. I don't like anything here at all, said Frodo. Step or stone, breath or bone, earth, air, and water all seem accursed. But so our path is laid. Yes, that's so, said Sam. And we shouldn't be here at all if we'd known more about it when we started. But I suppose it's often that way. The brave in the old tales and songs, Mr. Frodo, adventures I used to call them. I used to think, 
that they were things that the wonderful folk of the stories went out and looked for because they wanted them. But that's not the way of it with the tales that really mattered. Folks seem to have been just landed in unusually. Their paths were laid out that way, as you put it. But I expect they had lots of chances, just like us, of turning back. But only they didn't. We hear about those as just went on. And not all to a good end, mind you. You know, coming home and finding things all right, though not quite the same. But those aren't always the best tales to hear, though they may be the best tales to get landed into. I wonder, I wonder what sort of tale we've fallen into. So the question I ask myself and the question I have for all of you is what sort of tale have you fallen into? And I hope it's one that is ripe for remembering, for remembering the power of one, the power that's contained within each of us. I hope it's for remembering the power of friendship and community found here in this family of faith and in the circles that you hold dear, for remembering the importance of being present, for remembering that we don't know the final outcome, for remembering to look for inspiration, hope, and connection, even in the most unlikely of places, and for remembering that there is light and hope to be found even in dark and uncertain times. So I know what's part of my story right now is to go and vote on Tuesday. If you have not already done so, I encourage you to do that, to uh, reach out to those within your sphere of influence. You can look on your um, contacts lists and send a quick text, just reminding people to go out. Um, we're really at a very unique time in history. And I believe for right now, this is what we're being called to do.